gentlemen. I'm the Minister for uh, Space and Advanced Technology in the ACT. I have another rather portfolios as well, planning, emergency services uh, and police as well. Can I welcome you all here today and firstly acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians, and I respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to life in this area. Uh, can I also recognise the Honourable Dr Margaret Reid, AO, ACT uh, Senator and former President of the Australian Senate and wife of the late Tom Reid, Station Director for Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station. Uh, David Fields, uh, Director, Telstra Corporation and the Chairman of the Board of Heritage Telecommunications Limited. Uh, Mike Dean, of course, and John Saxon here. Uh, the, Mike was the Deputy Director of Honeysuckle Creek and John was one of the techs uh, out there as well. Can I welcome other uh, technicians and uh, PMG uh, workers that would have been there in the day. Well, on the 21st of July 69, at 12.56pm Australian Eastern Standard Time, mankind took its one giant leap and 600 million people watched as Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. It was the 26 metre dish at Honeysuckle Creek that was the main station assigned to receive the initial pictures from the moon and Neil Armstrong's first steps on the sea of tranquility. A critical part of the operations for Honeysuckle Creek and Tidbin Villa tracking station was the NASA Communications Switching Centre at Deakin. And this was part of the worldwide NASCOM network, a key link in the chain that is sometimes forgotten. The Switching Centre had a key role in the communication of information gathered through the network of Australian tracking stations and other Australia-based communications facilities and relaying them onto Houston. This facility was supported by the Overseas Telecommunications Commission and NASA and was based on equipment and services provided by the Postmaster General's Department. I have a personal connection, of course, with uh, the uh, Postmaster General's Department. My dad was a super tech uh, at East Box. He was in charge of the redundancy cable uh, from Honeysuckle Creek to Deakin. And um, I was able to sit there at the console with him during the landing. So it was a great opportunity for me. And I want to say in appreciation of the work that those technicians did, uh, my father was presented with the Apollo Achievement Award by NASA. And I have a framed copy certificate uh, on my wall at home. I also have an electronic copy which I try and share as much as I can. So as such today we are here to acknowledge another integral part of this grand endeavour, the people who worked at the NASA Communications Switching Centre in Deakin, the PMG Department and Overseas Telecommunications Commission, all of whom played such a vital role in the historic moment when man walked on the moon. So ladies and gentlemen, we have some key speakers to talk about uh, those times. And um, can I first introduce uh, Margaret Reid, um, and she will give you uh, a bit of history of her time uh, at, the, at the station. Me, you're all very excited to be here. This program is really amazing. A, an enormous amount of work has been put into putting it together. And I commend John Saxon and his committee for, the, for what they have done over many, many months in preparing for the events that are taking place in Canberra. It is very special indeed. And this is a wonderful souvenir to keep recounting those events. I also want to pay my respects to Telstra for remembering the switching station at Deakin and preparing this plaque to honour Kevin Westbrook and his team that worked there. The reason really why we didn't hear too much about the switching centre really was because it all worked so well. And you really only hear the bad stories, don't you? But it is exciting. I was, it was suggested to me that I recount a little of life in Canberra uh, in the mid to late 60s, and many of you here will have many other memories and perhaps no more than I did. But in 1966, there was a, a national census in Australia, and the ACT showed up as having 93,000 people. It's hard now to sort of think back to Canberra at that time, 
uh, but 93,000 people, most of them living in what is now referred to as the Inner South and Inner North, and a few were escaping into Woden Valley, and those in the Inner North and, into, and Inner South sort of said, why would you want to live that side of Red Hill? <laughs> But it was necessary, and of course many who came to work in the tracking stations at the time found it very difficult to get accommodation in Canberra. There were many families that were separated for periods of time while husband worked in Canberra at one of the tracking stations and the family was somewhere else until he was able to obtain accommodation in Canberra and move the family here. At the time of the census, Canberra had a quarter of its population between the age of 20 and 35. So it won't surprise you to know that we topped the list in the birth rate during that census. There were scientists, technicians, researchers, academics. It was a stimulating society as people moved to Canberra to take part in the considerable growth that took place at that time. And those who had escaped in the north and in the south, living in Hughes, Curtin, big machines were sort of preparing Garran, Lyons was on the horizon, and they were busy turning sort of rock and clay into gardens. Probably most of them, like the rest of Canberra, had a hill's hoist in the backyard, and they were looking forward to the owning a Victor Moa for when the grass finally grew amongst the rock and clay that they were working on. Alan Fitzgerald, who wrote for the Canberra Times at that era, referred to the Woden Valley development as true, true frontier land. <laughs> and I think it probably was. But of course, the rest of us heard moving into those areas, heard stories about inner south and inner north, of the burst pipes on the days when it was so cold that the pipes froze and then when they def when the defrosted, the water ran everywhere because the pipe had burst. One heard those stories at the time, uh, probably from the tea lady who went around the big offices of the great departments of state serving morning and afternoon tea. And it really was a most wonderful way to keep in touch with what was happening because the stories would be recounted. Bit of a pity some of these things have changed. You just, you have to find out gossip in a completely different way these days. But certainly um, the era of beginning of the word processors, still typewriters in many places. And children walked to school mostly, some perhaps were driven, but for the most part, children walked to school in the mid to late 60s. Beyond Hughes, Garran, Curtin, etc., it was pretty, pretty rusty. No made roads that the cars proceeded on to get to a rural valley and Honeysuckle Creek, except for the, the sealed road that the Americans put in. But across Woden Valley, uh, when it was wet, it was really just a sea of mud that the cars had to proceed through to get there. It really is one of the miracles of life, I think, that there weren't more significant car accidents as those teams of cars on a three-shift basis twice you know, every day went in and out to a rural honeysuckle, Tidbin Villa. Um, it, we, there, were, there were accidents, but it's amazing that there weren't more really significant accidents when you think of what they were doing and where, where they were travelling. But back to Canberra, there were at the time, amazingly, 700 organisations, community organisations, sporting, cultural, social, support, a, a truly extraordinary community that came together and worked together and enjoyed life together. Friday afternoons in the hot weather, not July, not moon landing time, sort of out to cab our pool and places to swim. Um, 
There were five hotels initially, uh, Ainsley, Civic, Hotel Canberra, the Kingston and the Wellington. And then in 1961, the brand new Canberra Rex down Northbourne Avenue. And 66, the Hotel Dixon. There were no licensed clubs, there were no poker machines, and a big night out was over the border at the mighty Queen Bean Leagues Club. Yes, I thought you would remember that. <laughs> I certainly, certainly do. But Canberra developed and grew, and I think we all enjoyed living here at the time. The televisions were these little boxes on about four legs that sat there, um, and we were pretty pleased to have them. They were important. And on the day of the moon landing, as I recall it, the schools around invited children to go home to watch it if they could get home, or presumably if there was someone at home. Because the schools, though they would have had one, maybe two televisions, didn't have sufficient to enable a whole school to watch. So people went home and, and watched uh, from their own, own homes. It was the year when you could not turn into a suburban street in the winter without being careful to avoid a large tanker delivering oil to, to a house, the houses in the street, because we all worked with oil heaters. Haven't seen one of them in years, but perhaps there aren't any left at all. When, when thinking about it, I think it's in the area of banking and shopping that perhaps is a huge difference between then and now. Not that we knew it, we accepted life with banks closing at three o'clock. Three o'clock on a Friday till 10 o'clock on a Monday, you had what you had in your wallet, and if it wasn't there, you couldn't get it. No credit cards, no automatic tellers, Friday night shopping here and Thursday in Queen Bean. Uh, at the weekend, the shops that opened closed at about midday. There were a few little ones that remained open. And that shaped our lives and that was how we lived. But we accepted that as the case. But it perhaps is shopping and banking that are two of the really significant differences that have occurred, not to mention all the technology. So this morning is an important part of the whole celebrations. I feel honoured to have been invited to take part in it and I look forward to the rest of the morning. That was a fantastic trip down memory lane. It brought back uh, a few memories for me. I actually have a Victor toe cutter at home that I've restored uh, in the shed. Uh, for those of you that are a little younger, they were called toe cutters because they had no ridge around the base plate and if you pulled it back too quickly, you would cut your toe. Uh, and, and you mentioned Alan Fitzgerald. Uh, he did move out to Farrah in the Woden Valley. Uh, I was his postman when he lived in Moody Street, so there's another memory. So thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, I'll now introduce John Westbrook to talk about the Deacon switching station. Good morning. Minister Gentlemen, thank you very much for the introduction. Fanal fellow panel panellists, Margaret, David, Mike, thank you very much for joining this session. It was, uh, it's fantastic. To all the vets out there, what a wonderful event these four days are. And I do concur with Minister Gentlemen and Margaret John. Your organisation skills have been brilliant over this period of 14 months, which I've been a pleasure to be part of. Mind you, figuratively, as part of these meetings, I've been to the moon and back. The memory on these gentlemen in their 80s is unbelievable. I try and remember what happened in the day. They go back to seconds. I think this switch was turned to that position on that day at that time. Their memories are, <clears throat> are like, like safe. They just don't forget anything. So. To the vets here, congratulations on a job well done. Here to talk in terms of the NASA Communication Centre, um, I, I, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and hope this comes up. I'd like you to reflect on the fact 
that if for eight minutes the people, the team in this photograph here hadn't been able to pull down the pictures from the moon. Nobody else in the world did it. There were some equipment failures, but for an eight minute period when the first step was taken, the team in this photograph here were able to do and perform miracles based on their professionalism and their expertise. It's really quite unique. The signatures up here are the... I'm not sure whether this is going to work well. The signatures are the operating committee for the organising for the, uh, for the, for the 50th. They've done, like I said, a fantastic job and they should be congratulated. But the people in the picture, they did an even more marvellous job. If we reflect on the fact that they weren't able to pull down the eight minutes, we'd only be reading about the first step and the first part of the moon landing in books. And wouldn't the space atheists have a field day? They'd be able to deny it all the way through. It was teamwork, and the teamwork was led by some tremendous leaders at the time, strong leaders. People like Mike, Mike Din, John Saxon. In Sydney, you had Bob Goodman, Keith Vincent. Uh, I'm going to forget a whole bunch of people, but they, and, and obviously Tom Reed, from, uh, who headed up the Honeysuckle, Honeysuckle Creek Station. But as part of the team, you also had the employees. And this is where a company such as Telstra now, PMG, OTC, became really very important. PMG supplied a lot of the manpower going into these teams. The expertise and the development that they were able to, to uh, propagate in the early days prior to the manned space missions was quite incredible. So David, to your, your predecessors, thank you very much. I think it was really very important. I'd like to focus on one person in particular, a person who I knew very well who unfortunately passed away about five years ago, and that was Dad. Make sure it's coming up. This is Dad when he was 20. <clears throat> he left school when he was 12. It was in 1940. Um, World War II was raging and most of the young men from Australia were overseas fighting the war. So uh, farm labour was very, very short. So Dad joined his father on the property, which was reasonably large, which was southeast of Perth in an area called Montagin, about 50 miles out of, uh, out of Meriden. His love of communications came about when one of the neighbours gave him a radio, gave the family a radio, and they said, we can't get this to work. The radio purely and simply won't pick up the signals from the nearest town, which was Meriden. Well, Dad concocted a series of aerials around the house. Grandma used to use those aerials as washing lines during the daytime. During the night time, the antennas, the aerials that Dad put up, was so good that he was able to pick up radio stations from Perth, Coolgardie, Kalgoorlie, all around the uh, eastern, western Australian region. He loved communications. And it was in a um, year later, 1949, when he was approached by a chap at the tennis club who was a PMG employee who invited him to actually join the PMG. Dad applied for it, uh, was successful in his application, and joined the PMG almost the next day. While he liked the farm, he also would like to get off it and try his hand at his true love, which was communications. In the PMG, he was a linesman for a short while. Then we moved to Edith Vale. I was only a young boy, two and a half, I don't really remember it, but that was the R&D section for Telstra or PMG at the time. Then came back, he worked at Cottesloe, uh, fixed a small project problem that was going on there, 
and then executed the project at Bunbury Telephone Exchange, which was completed on time, on cost, and with good quality. It caught the notice of the senior members of the PMG, and the senior members offered him to be second to the new tracking station at Muche in Western Australia. Muche, of course, was doing all the tracking work for um, the Mercury program, together with the other tracking stations around. One small anecdote involving Mum was that just before the launch of the, uh, the, the spaceship with Ham at the controls, Ham was a chimpanzee, first uh, um, biological organism into space, before the launch of uh, the spaceship with Ham, Mum gave Dad a bunch of bananas and she said, Kevin, I'd like you to put a banana on all of the consoles of all of the operators because if they're working with a chimpanzee, they've got to think like a chimpanzee. <laughs> Hamish Lindsay documented that in his book as did uh, James A. Michener in his book of space. So it was really quite a unique story at the time. From Uche we went to Carnarvon. And what a fabulous place to grow up. I was nine years of age and I'm pleased they didn't have any sort of PlayStations or Xboxes or anything else like that. We learned to fish. We went to school in our bare feet. It was just fantastic. The Beatles came along. This was 64. And boy, it was just a wonderful time to be alive. Uh, it was a boy's own annual time. From Carnarvon, we went to uh, South Australia, worked at WRE for 12 months, and then Dad was offered the position of officer in charge at Deakin. And this is where the Deakin Switching Centre became important. This was end of 1965, beginning of 1966. Dad worked there until 1981. Started from very humble beginnings, but just keeping the focus on Dad at the moment. Um, Dad was part of the Apollo program through Deakin. As Margaret mentioned, there were never any problems coming from Deakin, which was great. Dad brought home all the problems, discussed them with Mum. Mum solved the problems, he took them back, and everything was okay. So Mum was really the hero in all of this, and Dad was kind of the gopher, pushing it all forward. The pinnacle of Dad's career came in 1970. And he was awarded the Silver Snoopy, which I'm very proudly wearing today. The Silver Snoopy was an award made by the astronauts. It was the, it was the ultimate award given to people working in the manned space um, uh, program. For the Apollo 11 moonshot, only 80 people worldwide were given the Silver Snoopy. And this was nominated by Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins for their expertise, professionalism and contribution to the program and to that space shop in particular. As well as the Silver Snoopy, we got this wonderful personalised letter from Michael Collins who outlined exactly why Dad was made the, uh, given the award. But really, it was a team award. It was a team award for the Deacon Switching Centre. It was a team award for all of the tracking stations that were sending the signals through the Deacon Switching Centre onto Houston, through Paddington, excuse me, Jim, through Paddington and onto Houston. Um, they're wonderful mementos that we keep as treasures of that period of time. Uh, I'm now going to switch gears back to the Deacon Switching Centre, which we all came to listen to in the first place. Firstly, receiving the Silver Snoopy, February of 1970, PMG, Telstra, David, thank you once again. It was a wonderful opportunity from 1949 to 1970 that was quite a journey. I'm not a technical person for electronics communications. I do apologise to the people here who are professionals, experts. I'm not. Give me a, a bucket of water and I can analyse the water. Give me some microorganisms from virus particles and I'll do the DNA structure quite happily. But microelectronics and communications, I'm not. When I was preparing this presentation, I went to Colin McKellar, OAM, Colin, 
where are you? Congratulations. I went to Colin and I asked him for some diagrams to present a little bit on the technical side. And Colin sent me these two slides. When I opened the first slide, I went weak at the knees. When I opened the second slide, I got a massive migraine headache, so I closed them very quickly. Fortunately, Jim Simpson came to my rescue and he gave me that, which is a much more simplified diagram. Jim, where are you? Thank you very much. It was wonderful. First eight minutes, we pull the signal down and unfortunately the point is not working. Pull the signal down from the moon to Honeysuckle Creek Station. Went through to the NASA Switching Centre, which is in the middle there. Then on to OTC Paddington. Played a massive role in being able to decipher the signals coming through. Deacon Switching Centre was mainly involved in the voice and in telemetry signals coming through. OTC Paddington, then with the wonders of the world, we all work with different TV um, uh, configurations. The signal went up to Maury, and Maury converted from 320 lines per second, which was coming from the moon, to the NTSC signal configuration. I believe it's about 520 lines per second. Then to Intelsat and through to Houston. OTC Paddington also redirected down to the ABC, who then converted to 625 lines per second so that we could locally get the PAL TV signals. And so that's how the signals came from the moon through to our TV sets. Simplified diagram. Jim, thank you very much. Colin, I will study yours in the future, I promise. This was the start of the switching centre. It started from fairly humble beginnings and Dad sitting in his office going over the plans. Not even a seat, it was just purely and simply plans on the floor and it developed from there. The equipment started driving late in 1965 and the centre was complete in early 1966. Here we have Joe Gormley in two photographs in front of the control centres and at one of the stations there and we have the, an exploded view of the station in that part there. I've got to apologise to the Deacon people. We've been searching high and low for records of names of people who went through, who were part of the Apollo 11 space mission. We haven't been able to find any as yet. Joe Gormley, Cliff Hicks, Peter McLennan, Bill Brooks, they're all names which are familiar to me but there's a whole host of other people. There were 50 people who were working there at one stage who I can't find records of. And I, if you're present in the audience or relatives, family, I apologise because I don't have the names to be able to recognise properly. All facilities have a really one important area. Deacon was no di different to this. The key facility in the Deacon Switching Centre was one of two, used to carry one of two major phrases that will go down almost as famous, probably if not more famous, than phrases such as A2 Brute, Kiss Me Hardy, etc. The first one, of course, is very unique and it was one step on the moon, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The other one has been replayed countless number of times, even in the playgrounds. Kids will say, Houston, we have a problem. This was a key facility for Houston, we have a problem. Margaret's expose of Canberra in the 60s was wonderful, brought back a lot of memories. One of the memories she brought back was the smartphone of the 60s. <laughs> Little phone down there, you couldn't play PlayStation, you couldn't get on the internet, you couldn't do anything else expect except speak to people and listen to people, which is sometimes nice. Right up the top there is a button. Direct call into NASA. Houston, Canberra calling. Houston, we have a problem. That was the key facility. During the sims, during the testing of the circuits, of the relays, of the equipment, 
that phone was being constantly used to be able to bring the message to Houston that there was a problem that was being experienced. During the operations, during the space missions, there were no problems. Deacon worked very, very smoothly, thanks to, to the men working with Dad. Honeysuckle Creek, OTC Paddington, a marvellous network, a marvellous team. On reflection, if you could put that team of over a thousand people together and call it a sporting team, a political team, a business team, you would never ever lose a match. You would never ever lose an election. You would always be able to post excellent results on a quarterly and yearly basis. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, John, for that uh, fantastic walk down memory lane for the Deakin switching station. Uh, can I now introduce uh, David Piltz, who's the head of Telstra, but also, more importantly, the head of the Heritage section. Dave? Well, thank you, Minister. And uh, to my colleagues on the panel, um, welcome. And for you folks in, in the audience, uh, thank you for joining us today. It's a momentous occasion this week if we reflect back 50 years ago. The presentation I've got this morning has got some more of the technical aspects which I'll try to keep uh, interesting and entertaining. I have to acknowledge uh, straight up um, Colin McKellar, AOM, your fantastic work in putting the honeysucklecreek.net website together has been an inspiration. Um, there is so much information on there reflecting the wonderful efforts of everybody. Also, the people that have uh, taken the time so many years ago writing articles in the Telecommunications Journal of Australia, which I looked up and read avidly in my research for today. And uh, also some of the folks which are in uh, Heritage Telecommunications Limited, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Telstra. Uh, it owns the Heritage Collection, once owned by the Telstra Corp or Telecom Australia or the PMG. Uh, of which I have the uh, fabulous fortune of being the, the chairman of. Uh, the archives and materials we have uh, available to us have, have been uh, also able to contribute to this morning's presentation. I think everybody asks, uh, where were you on the 21st of July? So, um, 1969. I was a 14 year old schoolboy in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And we were sent home from school. The school didn't have enough televisions for everybody to watch. So I rode my bicycle back to my parents' home and sat in the lounge room. Uh, we had, I looked it up, uh, done my research. It was an AWA Radiola deep image, 23 and a half inch black and white TV set, exactly as shown on the photograph there. And I sat in the lounge room and I watched those images exactly as you see there. I found that just fascinating to see that event happen. But I think most people at the time had not realised what went on behind the scenes to make those images and those voice and the telemetry and information coming back from the moon to be received and relayed. And I've been reading a lot of the research on this and of course you see iconic images of John Kennedy and he made various speeches to set the scene in the United States to embark upon this mission. There's one particular comment he made at a, at a subsequent um, presentation in Houston, in Texas on the 12th of September 1962. We choose to go to the moon this decade and do other things, not because it is easy, because they are hard. And I think uh, anybody that's worked in the technology that's uh, part of this, they would actually totally agree with that sentiment. The organisations creating the capability for the NASCOM, the, the NASA Communications Network, as mentioned, are the folks in NASA themselves, the Postmaster General's Department with the Department of Supply and OTC Australia. And each brought particular aspects uh, to make the communications network come together and work. So a collection of technologies of the day for voice and data, telegraph and teletype terminals, some video switching, 
because it wasn't so many years before this that television was introduced into Australia. Um, data switching, it represented a $64 million investment by NASA, which in those days was a significant fortune. The Postmaster General had a network of voice and data and telegraph lines. It was only a few years since the introduction of what was known as the Community Telephone Plan in 1960, which the PMG embarked upon an ambitious program to automate the telephone network, which up until that stage was largely a manual network with some automatic switching in metropolitan areas. And OTC, with the latest satellite technologies from Intelsat and submarine cables, with accommodation and facilities, brought the whole thing together. So without labouring each of the individual links and connections across the network, it truly was an international network for NASA to have in place for the Apollo missions. If you recognise the simple facts of how the Earth rotates, and if you're looking at the Moon, you need three sectors across the Earth to make that work. The United States being the central part, a European connection and an Australian connection made that come together. It wasn't just satellite connections back to the US, but submarine cables, HF radios, ships at sea, aeroplanes in flight made that come together. We found in our records, and uh, as represented on the Honeysuckle Creek website, this diagram is there for all to see. And you might think, well, this is a complicated thing to read, but I just love the maps and the circuits like this because I can recognise all the codes on here for all the private lines and leased circuits that make up the network. There was a considerable amount of connections involved to make this work. And when I look at that, I reflect back in my watching the television my parents' home in 1969, and I joined the PMG four years later in 1973, and I'm still an employee of the company. NASCOM in Australia, and I've extracted this from the Telecommunications Journal, which looked more specifically at the connections within the country. The switching centre at Deakin, I can understand quite now, even 50 years later, how it was the hub in this part of the Australian network, because it interconnected, and it's the NSC diagram uh, symbol in the lower right, it interconnected into the domestic telecommunications network, but also meant that all the tracking stations, satellite earth stations, submarine cables, uh, and all the other uh, services were interconnected. It really was a state-of-the-art facility that Kevin Westbrook looked after. It, uh, it had a whole range of technologies in there, which I'll take you through in the next few minutes. Built in 1965, that building is still there, 107 Kent Street, Deakin. I actually took the time to go there yesterday afternoon. And on the first floor in one little corner, there was some old equipment gathering dust and I wiped the dust off and it said, property of the US government. <laughs> and I thought to myself, am I going to give that back to them or I just might leave it here in Australia? So I wouldn't be surprised if some of those things find their way into the um, heritage collection that uh, our organisation and others have. In researching my talk this morning, I thought, well, what was it that single piece of technology that might have helped most significantly to make this uh, venture and mission possible? There's a thousand different things that were invented as part of the space race. The, the technology of rockets, of uh, command modules and lunar modules for telemetry and tracking, for biometrics and life support systems, and it goes on and on. But I thought particularly for communications, there was a little invention in 1947 which really changed the technology front completely. So up until that time, thermionic valves was the way you amplified and transmitted information. 
that the guys in at and Bell Labs at Murray Hill in New Jersey um, invented the semiconductor device, the transistor. And over the next six years or so, that invention was put to a wide range of applications. It was put into consumer radios. I can still remember the, the radio that my parents had as a transistor 8, a uh, Philips radio. We used it in telecommunications equipment and it really had as an application a, a, an ability to revolutionise and miniaturise. And there's a photograph there of some various types of transistors. These days, largely integrated circuits and large-scale integrated circuits permeate the communications industry. But those sorts of transistors, when I pulled the circuit board out of the equipment yesterday at Deakin Exchange, there it was, those transistors, particularly that one on the, the right-hand side, that circuit board had that technology in it. It was used also in computers because the transistor had a unique a feature which could be switched on or off. So you could have a zero or a one, or a zero and a one, or a one and a one. So straight away, we've got the ability to have a computer recognise states of an electronic device and create a communications network <coughs> that can be controlled by software. The technology applications in the NASCOM network are just listed here. And I'm almost amazed why a, a Univac 418 digital computer manufactured by Sferi Rand was used. But it was also used in the US Navy for firing missiles and tracking them because the trajectory information on high-speed missiles meant that you had to do a lot of data manipulation. So that machine, an 18-bit word, so an 18-bit computer, most computers today have 64 bits, memory of 4,000 words, or 4K, sometimes up to 16K, quite remarkable for the day, but compared with what I carry in my um, Apple iPhone 10, um, not, a, not a, a patch on what we can do today. The other piece of technology I found quite amazing was the network was interconnected particularly back to the Goddard um, Communications Centre in Maryland and then down to Houston. It was a high-speed data modem manufactured by Western Electric. It was a Model 205B. It used a phase shift logic to send down a telephone line, a 2,400 bit per second connection. So it used a carrier in a voice frequency um, network and that link was important for the telemetry and, and tracking and course correction because of the computer manipulation of the tracking information. As we've heard from John, the voice conferencing and switching, there's teletypes, television relays, submarine and satellites, a terrestrial broadband network, which I'll show you in a minute, microwave radio, even HF high frequency radio and tropo scatter radio systems where links were built to bounce radio waves off the ionosphere. And of course, the multiple buildings, power and people that made all that happen. What I found amazing about the Univac 418 and the pictures on the left are the actual computers at the Deakin switching site. And there's one on the right that um, OTC used at Paddington uh, a few years later. There were no packet data store and forward message switching facility in Australia at all at that time. This was the first in the Deakin switch. So it took data information, switched it and connected it to the high speed links to the US. So 2,400 bits per second. If I look in the Telstra core network today, the high speed IP router runs at one terabyte per second, which is one times 10 to the 12th bits per second that it can switch, compared with 2.4 times 10 to the three. So it's just nine orders of magnitude different over those years.
the voice conferencing in switching and the photograph that John showed before of his father and a box in that box was the electromechanical telephone switching system which was installed. Uh, the bridge network that was connected up enabled multi-point conferencing to take place um, and the control equipment that enabled the switching um, meant that was uh, a fully interconnected voice network across the whole of the NASCOM uh, enterprise. Those voice circuits, um, a telephone voice circuit in those days is, was four kilohertz wide. As I mentioned, that modem and demodulator for that 2400 bit per second used a frequency of 1800 hertz. So anybody that plays the piano, that's a seventh, which is over there on the piano. Um, middle of C is 262 hertz. And we modulated that carrier with phase modulation to represent 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And that's the way the data was transmitted down the lines. But the control consoles, you can see, were all part of what I think, looking back, was just a wonderfully installed and high technology installation. A lot of the messages in those days were also by teletype, um, automatic telegraph. Um, they operated at 75 board. A uh, teletype machine had a keyboard which translated the letters into a, a code, and there's a uh, teletype tape indicated there. The Model 28 was used extensively, and there was some um, advertising from the company that manufactured that equipment at the time. Um, the voice frequency telegraph lines used tone modulation to transmit the telegraph data. That was also integrated into the Univac switch. So the machines could either send or receive or print and a lot of the written communications between stations was sent by teletype. In the HTL collections, the Heritage Telecommunications Limited collections, I had my folks uh, dig out some plans and they found some of the original drawings setting up the Deakin uh, arrangements for the telecommunications network and also in our collection a range of materials printed by OTC at the time celebrating various parts of the Apollo missions. The television relay and radio transmissions were a key part. As we've heard, the first minutes of the um, television pictures received a Honeysuckle Creek image in the centre bottom of the, of the slide. That image was passed on to a control centre in Paddington in Sydney with OTC. Also the parks uh, dish was able to be moved into position at the right time, being a larger dish. It was connected back into Sydney with a microwave radio link and the parks link tower with the microwave dishes being aligned is on the photograph on the bottom left. And that connected into the PMG's broadband microwave radio relay network taking that image back. And after those few minutes, the high quality image being received from Parks was switched at Paddington, as we've heard. And I've also included there the original tower that was at Red Hill, which provided connections across the valley to the tracking stations. It's quite amazing because the uh, broadband facilities that were used in those days being microwave radio, uh, coaxial cable terrestrial and coaxial cable submarine were viewed as broadband. Now today we talk about broadband as something completely different, something you get from the National Broadband Network and it's usually a consumer based connection to the internet. But broadband in those days meant that interstate transmission was on open wire lines often connected with a 12 channel carrier system which multiplexed together 12 voice circuits into one. And after you'd filled up the pole network, each of the sets of wires with enough 12 channel systems, you'd ran out. And as I mentioned before, the community telephone plan caused the PMG to invest in high speed voice multiplexing systems just because 
interstate voice telephony was going to become automatic. So there were coaxial cables put in in a number of places. There was certainly one in Western Australia feeding Carnarvon. There was ones to Moree. There's ones between Melbourne and Sydney. So there's a photograph on the right-hand side of the coaxial cable tubes at one of the repeater stations. And this is a photograph at the top left of a carrier centre, typical of the day. It looked very much like um, what we might have had in um, City South Exchange in Castle Ray Street in Sydney. Those techniques used a frequency division multiplexing technique which took each of those 4 kilohertz voice channels and bundled them together into a group of 12 and then took 5 of those and grouped them into a group of 60 circuits and you took 15 of those and you got a broadband system of 900 circuits on radio or on coax cable. When I went to Deakin uh, yesterday, there's also the photograph, the small photograph in the middle at the bottom of, of the channel modem equipment that would, it was used of the day. That's the equipment which has got uh, property of the US government on it, so there we have it. What I also noticed in the research was at the time there was a range of international specifications. So in the International Telecommunications Union, part of the uh, United Nations, there's subcommittees looking at technical matters. The CCITT is a French acronym committee for the, the um, coordination and standardisation of telephone and telegraph uh, specifications. And there's a copy of the, the specifications that the voice channels had to meet to make sure that the voice circuits uh, from here back to the US were within specification. And because of the high quality of, of the connections within Australia and leaving Australia uh, built by the PMG and OTC, all the connections from Australia easily met those international standards. There was two cable, uh, international cables built in the 60s the Commonwealth Pacific Cable, the compact cable, uh, 8,300 nautical miles long, made by STC and submarine cables, was put into service in 1963. It uh, went from Australia to New Zealand, uh, through the South Pacific to Hawaii and then on to the US. Um, it had 80 telephone circuits on it. That was the sort of cable that it looked like. It had uh, high voltages and underwater repeaters connected to it, very similar cable, was built for CECOM in 1967. So, as I said, the leading edge technologies were used to create the NASCOM network. And if I look at that cable construction and I look at a sub-optical submarine cable which is being built today, it looks remarkably similar. And the only difference would be the central core, which is a little piece on the far left, instead of being a copper um, wire, is actually a tube with optical fibres in it today and very much of the rest of it looks so similar. Just to finish up looking at the facilities at Deakin and John put up the floor plan before, um, this is the ground floor or was the ground floor of the building and, and all those um, facilities that were built and run by all those remarkable people to keep it on the air all the time. So Kevin must have had a lot of fun going to work in that facility. So not only the, the switching equipment, the computers, the teleprinters, the transmission circuits, the voice connections. In the back rooms were um, no break power supply sets, um, continuously rotating no break. Behind that was a diesel generator, which is still there. Uh, often a lot of the American-based equipment ran on there, 110 volt. AC system, so we had to do 240 to 110 volt conversions. And there's a photograph of the, the uh, Deacon Switch building uh, taken the other day. The building is still in use by Telstra. Um, the top front part of the building has um, some mobile space station equipment in it for 3G and 4G. And no doubt at some stage 5G will be installed and at the back there's a a telecommunications tower with the antennas on it and the building at the rear is the new building. 
when I look at the photographs that uh, are posted on the honeysucklecreek.net website, they're really remarkable. And I would say this, this is as good as any station would have been anywhere, um, with Kevin oversighting it. Um, nothing looked out of place. It, was, it, it must have been a, a well-run organisation uh, and enterprise. So that facility, as I mentioned, is, is the key hub for the switching of communications for NASCOM in Australia. I have to mention, just in finalisings, there are other iconic sites which should be mentioned, other than Deacon, Honeysuckle Creek, of course, and Parks and Moree and Paddington. Um, I still look back, I, I can remember when I first started that photograph from OTC, that book uh, I read when I first joined. And I've certainly been to Parks Radio Telescope, being the um, the Paddington International Telecommunications Building. And there's a photograph there of the, the front door that was on the Deakin site with, with all the decals. Um, and I think that's in, stored in good, good hands. Perhaps we can bring it out for display at some future date. So thank you very much for um, listening to some of the technical aspects of the telecommunications, a part of the Apollo program and Apollo 11 in particular and I hope you can recognise now the significance of the people, the places and the technology here and about in Canberra and other places which made that possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, David. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to just do the unveiling of the plaque, and then we're going to hear from Mike Din. So I'm going to take the microphone down uh, to Mike, and then we might have a, a couple of questions uh, and answers just after that. I'm... Uh as I said, representing the user of everything you've heard come before. And in some ways, I have little or nothing to say because it was transparent. Uh, I've said a few times recently, the tracking station, when they were doing their job properly, they were transparent. Uh, we were transparent between the astronauts in Houston and of course the, the compact, when they were doing their thing, well, which they did, uh, they were transparent. We didn't know uh, uh, that much of them, but nevertheless, they were absolutely and utterly vital. They were as much a part of the total Apollo mission success as any other element, including that person who wrote me an email, I don't know if he's here this morning, who said, I was up Red Hill in the middle of the cold, and if it wasn't for me, that television would have never left Canberra. He was just as important, and someone else at Williamsdale. Is that him over there? Um, and I, can't, I keep stressing this, the whole thing was a team event. Uh, everybody was in series, and if anybody didn't do their job, everything uh, would have fallen over. Uh, OTC, PMG, of course. I learned that uh, PMG were NASA's, uh, rather, NASA was PMG's biggest customer in the 60s. And uh, so they set up a whole host of support, and we had a thing called critical coverage. Uh, whereby no PMG person was allowed to operate any piece of equipment or work on it if it was carrying the NASA circuits going through it. It caused great disruption throughout the whole of Australia, but uh, I only found that out later, and that's indicative of uh, how professional the, uh, the comms world were. Uh, in later years, we had a dedicated support group in Sydney, led by a fellow called Peter Barrett, who I'd have loved to have tracked down, but uh, haven't successfully uh, been able to do. Uh, the microwave out of Honeysuckle. Uh, we received a uh, television on Apollo 8 on Christmas Day, but we couldn't do anything with it. We had no connection out of Honeysuckle uh, into Canberra. And so came Apollo 11. Uh, there was great support from BMG, but also the various commercial TV stations supplied lots of dishes. And you'll see that odd picture of the tower with at least four dishes on it, getting the signal uh, in and out of uh, uh, Honeysuckle. 
into Ray Williamsdale and into, uh, into the town. Um, I'll just sort of finish really with the two or three anecdotes. Uh, um, Kevin Westbrook and I worked up a, a scenario one time. When driving to work from Thawar along to the Honeysuckle turn-off, there were two pieces of two wire, two couple of wires running alongside the road there. And every time I rode by, particularly with Tom Reed, I'd say, Tom, it's frightening. All our comms are being carried on those two pieces of copper. And if anybody ran into a pole there, which occasionally people got close to it. However, we did have circuits back over the microwave link to Tidbinbilla and then into Deakin. So I set up with Kevin, I said, Let, let's simulate an outage on that uh, p p piece of copper, which uh, sort of Kevin, me and Tom were, I think the only people who knew we were gonna do this. And we pulled that during a simulation. Well, needless to say, chaos reigned. First of all, agreeing that there was an outage. Secondly, where it might be. Thirdly, what the hell to do about it. And fourthly, who was going to lead it? And uh, it turned out we didn't have any documentation, no one had thought it through, but everybody learnt the lesson. And uh, I sort of in charge of the operation at Honeysuckle, we moved up a notch in our competence through, uh, through having that little simulation. Nevertheless, the com world used to have, I say this in the uh, best of intents, there was a comms and mafia. Uh, in other words, as and when there was a problem in comms, the com world would close ranks worldwide, worldwide. And uh, one had to get into this little group and uh, make sure you could speak the same language. In fact, there was a thing called an older wire that went all around Australia. Fascinating thing to listen into. Every little corner of Australia was on it. And I found there were lots of little chats going off there that I wasn't aware of. And so I said to uh, our comms man, uh, and I said, hey, I want a button on my intercom where I can listen to that older wire. And uh, it was fascinating. The tremendous work being done all, all around the country. And the other beautiful phrase I learned working with comms people, well, it's all right leaving us. <laughs> we all got used to that phrase. Uh, whenever there's a problem, you get this, all right leaving us. Uh, and finally, that comments on 2.4 two, on kilobit circuits. We ran up the Apollo mission on two 2.4 kilobit data circuits. Now, how one needs all these gigabytes, even for your own little home comms, is astounding, astounding. But uh, we did that with a few voice lines as well, and, and one line dedicated to us, uh, us not biomed. Anyway, in, in summary, uh, the com world did its job magnificently, magnificently. I got to know Kevin very well. We lived in the suburb of Lines just next door. Used to meet uh, Kevin and wife at uh, Coles in the Curtain, and uh, it was a tight little group in, the, as Margaret says, in the south of uh, Canberra, when you saw dirty, uh, dusty Holdens, green Holdens riding around, you knew that was a tracking station thing. Um, so I'm very pleased to uh, support, uh, support the, the general uh, intent of all this. The role of comms was absolutely imperative. In fact, there's a movie called The Vital Link, which I mean, you get a chance to see that discusses the whole worldwide comms. Oh, and there's one person I've got to mention, Stan. Stan Anderson? Where's Stan? Over the f way there. Stan is over from California. Uh, Stan used to be in charge of the operation of all the Araya aircraft, the tracking uh, aircraft which were uh, complementary to the stations. And uh, I think your airplanes used HF, didn't they, uh, Stan? At least uh, up until Apollo 13. Okay, so... <laughs> Well, there's a whole another part of comms which uh, existed and used the Australian facilities as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That's my summary as a user. Mark Dean. Oh, <laughs> sounds like a personal question. Well, this is not directly to do with comms, uh, and we could spend three hours talking about parks and honeysuckle, but I'm not going to do that. 
Uh, but uh, John Bolton got to know very well as the director of Parks, and we had this debate, who got the first television? And in the end, I got in writing from John Bolton, signed, said it to Ron Eckers, who was the head of the Radio Physics in Sydney. I said, well, the first television, uh, the parts of the majority and best. That was our summary. <laughs> well done. Oh, fantastic. Well, I think we might just close up. We have some tea and coffee uh, ready for you to join our guest speakers. But just in closing, John touched a little bit on the personal aspect of the PMG and Telstra, the family aspect of it. And I thought well, I'd just quickly share mine. So um, John's father was a, a, a liney for a little while. My dad was also a liney during World War II. The PMG sent most of the techs out to do liney work. Dad met uh, my mum at Braidwood. She was a uh, telephonist at Braidwood. There was only three in a little wooden shed. I have a photo of mum and her two colleagues with the Bakelite headsets on and the party line phone jacks. And uh, he brought her back to Canberra uh, and she continued to work uh, as a telephonist at East Block, at the front of East Block where the, um, where the Postmaster General's office was at the time and Dad worked in the back. So he used to dink her down from Reed, down uh, Anzac Parade across Scott's Crossing on the BSA Bantam, up through the sheep paddocks to East Block. The other fond memory is, as a young person, uh, PMG always had Christmas parties for the kids, and it was usually uh, down at the Cotter, around Casarina Sands. Uh, and of course, we would have ice creams all day and hot dogs and uh, do three-legged races. And the end of the day, all the kids received a, a gift, a Christmas gift. I still have mine. So it's a, a, a it's a Tasco microscope that I don't think Mum and Dad could have ever afforded, and I still have it in the box at home. Thanks very much for coming. Come and join us for a cup of tea. Well, welcome everybody. So glad you can be here for this screening. My name's Colin McKellar, and it's my privilege to introduce what we're going to see. There are lots of Apollo 11 movies out at the moment. Some old, some new. And you can see as many as you like, but everybody says this is the one to see. You know it. And it is great to have with us tonight, today, this afternoon, Stephen Slater, who's come all the way from the UK via Switzerland and Houston and all these other places. And he's here with us. Stephen is the archive producer for the film Apollo 11. And he and others have been working for so long. And it's, uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about the film in a minute, and then afterwards there'll be time for questions, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen the full movie yet either. Stephen said, don't see it until you see it on the big screen. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, this is unlike any other Apollo 11 movie, and I hope you really enjoy it, what's there. So, um, Stephen? Yeah. Um, well, welcome. Right. Is this thing on? Oh, okay. Right. Um, thank you very much, Colin. Um, it's, it's such an incredible um, privilege to be here um, and to show it to, to the men of um, Honeysuckle Creek and Parks and all the Australian tracking stations. Colin is actually a huge uh, reason why I'm here. And also, he was a very, very big influence in, in the film. His website detailing the history of this thing is going to be an extremely valuable document, I think, for the, you know, in the future for preserving the memories of what happened here. Um, I was born in 1987, so I have absolutely no memories of um, <laughs> watching this. Um, but I can, I can imagine how, you know, seeing the film of people watching around the world, just how amazing it was to see those pictures from the moon and to think it all, a lot of it was because of the work of you guys and the, you know, people in Australia um, and in America, of course, but um, the first pictures were from Honeysuckle Creek and um, that's never going to change. So, uh, um, yeah, th this project actually started, uh, we done a very similar short film about Apollo 17, which, uh, which also was... Uh, Track from Australia, and it was the the idea behind the film was to just do a comp do this completely with the archive, not interviewing the astronauts or scientists or have any kind of narration, but to, to try and make a real immersive 
experience. Now, whether we succeeded or not, I'll, I'll have to let you uh, be the judge of that. Um, but what I think is best is that I get off the stage and then hopefully you've, you'll have some questions at the end and I can come back. And um, please enjoy Apollo 11. Thank you.